Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, uh, you're very welcome. I am going to roughly uh, rush you through all of the high points of GDPR because I know everyone is very excited at, at this as a topic. Um, and so try not to yawn. I won't I won't be looking at the screens so uh, just to, so that I won't see the yawning, but we'll make it as exciting as we can we can do. Um, at the end, I give you a couple of examples of very recent prosecutions just to kind of put it in context. Yeah, I'm going to try and do that. All of that as quickly as I possibly can so that we have as much time as possible for questions and I'll field questions in whatever way. Uh, Janice will help me manage that. Um, okay, so I'm going to screen share the slides. Just before we start, the, this session will be recorded, guys, just so that you know that up front. Share. And just to say, uh, we, we have... Uh, checked with the guys and um, the they will be editing the recording so a certain amount of this but any uh, so anything I suppose we're sensitive to the fact that asking a question is perhaps disclosing some sort of information and we're we're going to be sensitive to edit all of that out. All right now I'll just stop looking at myself and it won't be so distracting. Um, right okay so we'll, we'll we'll give a lash through so Good morning. GDPR and the excitement of GDPR um, is legislation that came into being across the entire uh, European Union from tw May 2018. By now, every company is expected that you have a handle on this. And I have a little quick graphic from the uh, Data Commission uh, that, that I put up later on. And these slides are available to, to have these slides uh, from the guys in the URF. Uh, so you're very welcome to that. Um, <clears throat> so let's just make sure that we all know a little bit of the terminology. So from a terminology perspective, the first thing is a data subject. So when you read documentation, you read anything about GDPR, you'll hear the data subject. The, the data subject is the person that is identified by the data. So that's you or me. It can be as simple as my, my email address, for instance, is mary at hrbrief. That tells you information about me. And mary at hrbrief.ie, well, what does that tell you? It tells you that mary works at the HR brief, that that's a company. The .ie tells you it's in Ireland and that there's an email address. Um, so that is identifiable information. So whether you want that information or not, so if I send you an email, you are now storing email belong information belonging to me if I, if I merely send you an email. So the slightest contact with data from other people, you have to have a pre a pre recorded or a, a pre arranged response uh, and protocol in how you're going to take that. So we're we're in general in the recruitment industry and in the recruitment, you may get unsolicited emails that have CVs attached to them. So that means you have are now in possession of of data subject identifying information uh, and that you need to have a response to that. Personal data is that identified. Can we have someone um, with a uh, not on mute? So if you wouldn't mind, please checking the journey mute. Uh, so personal data is anything that tells you about that data subject. So as I say, so even something as simple as the email address tells you something about the the, the subject. And people must uh, you must treat it very carefully. You have to have an attitude about data because data is the new gold. You know, it, it is it is what is mined for criminal purposes, for marketing purposes. It is what is used and manipulated for to get advantage in business. And, you know, it, it is necessary to hold data um, in recruitment because you are trying to supply people for, for jobs. Uh, and to, uh, so, so that data actually is the, the bread and butter of the recruitment industry. And um, so that personal data must be treated with great respect where you must be protecting it uh, and making sure that it is not likely to be taken by anyone else or used for any other purpose than for the purpose that you, uh, you got it. Processing is anything that you do with the data. And that includes even just being in receipt of it just getting that email. So an email that, from me to you that says, hi, is you processing my data because you have an email from me. So processing isn't some big manipulation, although it's that too, but it is very simply also even being in receipt of information from someone. 
Special or sensitive data is data that can lead to the profiling of people. Um, and that, and in particular, where the sensitivities are political opinions, racial or ethnic origin, you know, religious beliefs. Uh, so you 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 need to make sure that it can't be it can't be manipulated that you're to pull out all of the people that are you know, from a, a particular demographic or a particular race or to exclude or to include uh, people of a particular religious belief or a sexual orientation or a, or gender. Um, so it's, it's sensitive data. is a little bit along the lines of employment equality and um, it, the, the, the protected categories. It goes a little bit beyond that. So because we will also include in it, in certain parts, uh, you may have a vetting for individuals. So that is particularly sensitive data because you are uh, dealing with maybe someone having a criminal record and you hold that data about them. And it's something that uh, if if it were if, if it were manipulated, if people were profiled on the basis of it, uh, that it would lead into unlawful activity. Uh, so you have to have if you ha if you need to hold sensitive or special data, and that includes um, that includes medical certificates uh, on your staff. Uh, then you have to have a, a you you have a greater duty towards that data and towards making sure that that data is treated with respect. Data controller is the organization or entity that is collecting the data and defining what sort of data is being collected. So you are the data controller in respect of any candidates that come into your into your business and um, in respect of the suppliers to your business, your own internal employees. And um, you are you are controlling the data. You are collecting it. You are storing it and um, you are de deciding what data is collected and how that response would be. So you're in control of it. Then you have a data processor. So maybe an easy way to visualize this is a data processor is your accountant, your auditing company. So it is your information, your data, your staff's um, information, and um, your auditor reviews that. Or maybe if you have an external payroll company, they are processing that on your behalf. They don't control what data is collected. They don't control how it's stored. Instead, they do what they are told by you as the data as the data controller. So that's the data controller processor. If there's a breach, it is the controller that is sued, not the processor. And it is the controller who has the obligations um, to report the breach. If the processor, so, so the relationship between the controller and processor is governed by a data processing agreement, and that is a, a document, a legal document that you issue to them to tell them how, the, the standards that you expect to have in place. And those standards must be adhered to. And a failure of those standards means that then if you are sued, you can sue the data processor uh, for recovery of any losses as a result. Okay, looking at the data protection principles. So these are the, the general, there are, there are six of these. The first is that all data that you hold, you must process it lawfully, fairly, and, and with transparency. So in, in order to process it lawfully, you have to have a lawful reason for gathering it. And here we have um, on, the, on the side here, consent, contract, legal obligation, vital interest, public tasks, and legitimate interest. So consent is something that we all talk about and we're quite familiar with giving consent to our data being collected. For consent to be exercised and for consent to be the lawful basis on which you will process data, and it must be that if I say no, I won't suffer any detriment. So if I, if I don't consent to receiving marketing emails from Ticketmaster, that doesn't stop me from buying the tickets. It doesn't stop me from enjoying the service. So my consent is freely given or freely withheld. But if I'm going to work for Ticketmaster, I don't give consent when I give them my PPS number, when I give them my bank account details. I'm not consenting to them having that information because if I don't give them that information, they can't pay me and, and, and I can't work for them. We can't enter. So then the lawful basis is contract, which is the second one there. So you enter into a contract. So sometimes in the context of a contract, you have to share information with each other. 
Now, I would argue that in the recruitment industry, if if I come to your company as a recruiter and I am saying um, that you are, I, I want you to represent me and get me a really fancy job, um, in that I am I'm entering into a verbal contract where I'm I'm establishing you as my agent in going and procuring me job me work. So there is a contractual basis in which we're operating. I I expect that, that when I give you my qualifications and my work experience yeah, and information about me, that you are going to use that for that purpose and that purpose only. Um, and and that and then that, that that's that's our agreement. You're not going to use it to go and sell that information to other companies so that I can be sold products. And um, that's outside of the of the contract. The thing about a contract is I can't object to the to the um the the use of my data unless the contract is coming. I'm bringing the contract to an end. And the next is legal obligation. So we, in with regard to your own employees, you must make returns to the revenue commissioners. You must maybe, you know, perhaps pay pensions. Um, there, are, there are legal obligations. You have to hold records for the, um, for the Workplace Relations Commission under the Organisation of Working Time Act. And consequently, you are under a legal obligation. Nobody can tell you, delete all my data. So they can't take a hump on a Friday and, and tell you to delete everything that they have. Have because so and you see there the right to erasure they don't get that right because you you have to store data so for instance timesheets things like that have to be held for three years and um, in order for you to comply with the workplace relations commission obligations on you and um, so they're, they're important things vital interests generally that's in the context of an emergency of a of a um a, a situation like that sometimes next of kin is argued under vital interest um but but generally speaking this is when you look for information in the emergency ward you know that that's maybe where you think of that public tasks that's in the context of, of public service so it doesn't really us and legitimate interest then could maybe best be described as if I go into and anyone who who I do GDPR with is going to be bored silly with, with this analogy, but this best describes the legitimate interest. If I go into Power City and I buy a kettle, um, they take a receipt, they take my email address for the to, to email me the receipt. And then they email me a week later to offer me a, a sale on a toaster. There is a legitimate use of my email address to sell me the toaster because I bought a kettle last week. The two are associated and you can argue that the use of my, my email address in that context is fair enough. For that legitimate interest to be exercised, I have to be able to unsubscribe from that. I have to be able to say, no, 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 I don't want anything else. But if they send me an email that's completely apart from if they want to send sell me a computer or sell me something completely different or sell on my information to a, a sister company that is outside of of legitimate interest and it's a breach of the e-marketing directive uh, so that isn't legitimate interest so legitimate interest is the use of the data for a purpose that is very closely aligned with the purpose for which you gather the, the data so that's a, a, an important exercise. So when we when we go back and we look at lawfulness, that there has to be one of those lawful bases. It has to be fair. So you can only use it for the purpose for which you collected it and in accordance with the purpose that you collected it. And you have to be transparent about it. And where transparency comes in is that you have a, a privacy notice that is available at the point of collection of data. So generally that's on a website. Um, and that, and in that privacy notice, you are telling anyone that you're going to gather data from how you're going to deal with the data. And um, so it has to be transparent. So this is the number one principle. The second one is purpose limitation. You can only use it for the purpose for which you collected it. And um, so, and, and I think I've elaborated on that already and, and you get the picture there, but you must, you must use it for the purpose. So if you open up a whole new company that is aligned and loosely you know you you there is a, a there is a legitimate interest argument and there is a way of using data in that per, in the, for that purpose but people have to be told what they're doing and what how you got the data and why you're doing it and um, so that's very important no process that has to be um, going through there um so purpose limitation, very, very important that you don't allow it to be manipulated. Where that comes up maybe in recruitment is if you get CVs uh, from advertising for one job, 
you cannot then go and use it for a load of other things without first telling the person that you're going to do that. Um, so that's maybe where you see it. Data minimization is that you only collect what you need. Uh, you don't, and then when you have it, that you delete it when you stop needing it. So in the in the run up from a, a recruitment on the day when I send you my CV yeah. for, for a job, and um, in that in that context, um, you only need my CV. You only need my qualifications. You don't need my PPS number. You don't even need my date of birth. You don't. There are things that you don't need to be able to perform the purpose for which you've gathered the data. Um, and over gathering just may just creates a risk and a liability and it is in breach then of this principle and that's one of the things where um the the data commission get touchy about it that if you're over gathering so you need to look at things like application forms and the the, the data collection point and are you over collecting information at that point so data minimization is is really important accuracy all the information that you have on someone must be accurate and um, so you have a duty to make sure that it's accurate i think that we're we're in a certainly a multicultural um world now making sure that you have an accuracy with foreign national names is really really important um i i know i i tend to uh, get get part of my name dropped and um, and they'll call me mary carney instead of siri carney um, and that that lack of accuracy really annoys me and when, especially if people are trying to peddle things to me um, so so accuracy you have duty in law though to make sure that it's accurate and one of the things that i suggest to people is that maybe every January you could touch base with your clients, uh, touch base with your candidates and um, ask them if they'd like to update their information and give them that opportunity to correct or to change if they moved house, if they've had any change of information. And then you are demonstrating that annually you take care over accuracy. And then obviously if somebody raises an issue that you correct it immediately. Storage limitation, you only store it for as long as you need it. And you must justify why you are needing it for the length of time that you are. So there are some industries and there are some areas where you have to keep information for a very long time. Um, there may be a fiduciary duty or something like that going on. Uh, so you have to, to hold it for a long time. But generally speaking, if I finish work on a Friday and I'm no longer working with you on Monday morning, you don't need my bank details. To store them beyond that is... Um, is is unlawful, but it also is attracting a risk in terms of the information that you're carrying that you could do you could do away with. And lastly, is integrity and confidentiality. There is an assumption that when you are a data controller and when a data subject gives you their personal data, that you are treating that confidentially, that you are ensuring that the data is held with integrity and in that means that means holding it together and that it can't be breached so that touches on that you're not going to have laptops in cars you're not going to that are that can be just left on the seat and stolen and there's access to information that you have material out on desktops you have material out in in your offices even and um, you know that you need to have a clean desk policies that how we how is if people print off information are they properly destroying it is it properly being shredded is your shredder compatible with gdp or does it properly shred the information shredding it into stripes is no use um because they can be reassembled and criminality criminal gangs do that and um, they go through bins they try and gather information like that when you see cyber attacks that's about trying to gather information and harvest information because information is power in the way that we work in a digital world now so you have a duty to make sure that you have systems in place for the manual care of of data but also for the for the um online or the 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 it based data that you have that done so a, a quick inventory of, of what of what you need to kind of ask yourselves are, and um, why are you holding the information? So when you look at the data, the personal data that you have, why are you holding it? How did you get it? Why was it originally gathered? How long will you retain it? How secure is it? And do you ever share it with third parties? And if so, who knows about that? And what protocols do you have in place on that? If you can answer all of those sensibly, um, and with respect for the the data that you're holding, and with respect for the individual, then 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 you're you're nearly there on GDPR, um, and, and that you you have that mapped out. 
Okay. When a data breach happens, and data breaches happen all of the time, you just maybe aren't sensitive to the fact that a data breach has happened, or um, your your so 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 simple things can happen. You can send an email to the wrong Mary, so you can have two Marys in your email. I um, in the prompt. Yeah, you can send an email to the wrong Mary. That's a, that's a reasonably frequent occurrence. If there's nothing personal in it, it's not a big deal. You contact the person on the other end and you ask them to delete it. Uh, and something like that, where the integrity of the information um, ha is is adjudicated to be very, mi very minimally affected, um, then you don't need to do a breach. However, let's supposing it attached uh, a medical certificate for a member of staff and you thought you were sending it to your person in HR, but you ended up sending it to somebody else. Then you have transmitted personal information about an individual, and that is a breach that requires notification. And the notification must happen within 72 hours of you becoming aware. It's a very detailed document on the Data Commission uh, website that you must fill in. Um, ideally, by the time you're filling it in, the uh, the and it's within the 72 hours because you have to explain why it isn't, if it isn't. They look for the precise time of the breach. So they're very pernickety in the information that they want to collect. But by the time you're notifying it, you have addressed it, you have dealt with the matter. Um, and generally speaking, nothing ever comes of that. And there isn't any problem. They'll come back and they'll say, that's good. That seems to have been dealt with fine. Assuming that there isn't a complaint, you won't hear from us again. Um, when they get a complaint, the data commission reference that against the data breach notifications that they've received. So if they have a complaint and over here, there's a notification and in that notification, it shows comprehensively how the matter is dealt with. Then they will send that to the complainant and they will ask the complainant, are they satisfied with the, with the response? And um, if there's no breach notification and there's a complaint, then the data commission will get very seriously annoyed with you. Um, so it is better to over notify of breaches than to under notify of breaches. And as I say, in the mass majority of things, very simple breaches, human error happens all of the time. That doesn't mean it's okay. And any time it happens, you've got to review your processes, make sure you go back and have a chat if it's an individual. Um, you know, one of, one of the things that I suppose that you would come across is this, where, where an email is sent to the wrong person. It's a very simple thing, a psychological trick in making sure that that doesn't happen is you fill in the body of the email first and then you do the addressee last. The reason being that when if you do the addressee first, which we tend to do, we work from the top of the email down. If you fill in the addressee first, you're actually distracted by what you're going to type. Whereas if you type what you're going to type and then you fill in the addressee, you're not distracted when you're filling in the addressee and you're much less likely to make a mistake. It's a simple psychological trick, but it works. Uh, so simple protocols like that. If you have that as a protocol um, and then you remind people of that, you issue it. If there's been a breach, you issue that to your staff and to your colleagues. And um, generally speaking, that is acceptable by the, the DPC. Okay, data subject rights. So just, just have a look, just so that you know what people have. So first of all, they have a right to access their information. I have a right to know what you're holding on me and where you're holding it. So we need to be careful, particularly if in, in recruitment around this, because if I email you in my CV, it's in my outbox. That's okay. I've sent it. So I know that. It's in your inbox. If you send it to Billy, at the next desk, it's in your inbox, your outbox, and his inbox. If he says it sends it on to Mary, then it's in, and all of a sudden the locations of data start multiplying. So when we look for a right of access, that includes all of that. Who has seen the data? Who where has it been shared? Where has it been stored? And exactly what you have on me. So that's the kind of level of detail that is required. So in order for you to, first of all, be aware that a data subject has the right to know and have access to their data and know what's been done with it and who's, who's been shared with. And what is also included in that is you have to be able to respond to that. So when an access request comes in, you've got to be able to respond to it and know what, what do I going to do? How do I search for where all the data is? And so the better thing is at this side of it, before there's ever a data access request, that you have looked and refined where data might be. 
So if you have a CRM system, that information is uploaded there. So it's only ever in one place. place. And you're looking for it to be deleted then if it's in that inbox that where I've sent you the CV. So that, that makes sense. Um, so right of access means knowing where who it was transmitted to, as well as uh, where it is stored. Right of rectification is if there's any if there's anything inaccurate. So this is aligned to the accuracy principle. If um, if there's anything inaccurate, you are obliged to rectify it um, immediately. Right to object processing. So I can say if if I send you a CV and you say to me, well, the parent company here, we would like to put you forward for you know Microsoft, but the parent company decision is in the states. And some people are touchy about their information going to the States because everything goes through Homeland Security and, and whatever. You can say, no, 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 I don't want you doing that. So it's OK to object to where the processing might be. Um, and uh, people can 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 just do that. And um, they can can object to, to you holding data or doing a particular thing with the, the data. Um, right to restrict processing i can so let's say i was thinking of suing you i could say i want you to hold you have to to store that information you're not to delete it you're not to um you're not to do anything with it and um, i i want to i want you to just hold it there and do nothing with it for the time being so that's a restriction and a right to erasure and um, so i've a right to say i want you to delete everything you have on me you may not be able to delete everything you have on me if i've been your employee you're going to want to, you're going to have to keep records and this is where consent and um, is not legitimate when it comes to where you have other legal obligations around the, the the manipulation of data and the processing of data so right to erasure isn't an absolute right it is a qualified right what you can erase you will erase if uh, if it is requested. Right of data portability, and that is that um, that the the information has to be readable. Where where I've come across this is uh, as a as a barrister, I've worked and um, helping families stay in their in their homes when they were they were threatened, perhaps with repossession and that. And, and generally speaking, when I would look for the data, the file that a bank would hold on on a couple. Yeah, for instance, um, the bank used to have, before GDPR, the bank would send you a disk, but the disk could only be read if you were on a bank computer. It couldn't be read. I couldn't stick it into my own computer at home. And, I, and so I didn't have access. I had the data, but I didn't have access to, to actually being able to read it. So it wasn't really portable to me. Um, so that's where portability, it has to be in a readable scene since GDPR I get a right to say, actually, I want it in a, I want it in a format and in a program that I can access um, in, in order to do that. So, it's, so from that point of view, but you've got to think about if somebody looked for it um, from you, are you able to email it? Will there be integrity around that email? And um, will that all happen? OK, um, this doesn't come up so much. It comes up very much in the insurance industry, but the right not to be subjected to um, an automated decision. There has to be a human being somewhere ultimately making decisions and that can be a feel, a, appealed to or that can be spoken to so that you don't have an AI making decisions. Recruitment generally is moving towards an AI direction and um, depending on the scale of your business. Uh, so just be, be mindful if you're bringing in any sort of AI to uh, sort CVs or anything like that, there's inherent biases in a lot of them for a start. Um, but also you need a human being that's overseeing it and people have a right to that. Uh, so you, you it, insurance quotations is where this really in the main comes up. You have a right to make a complaint. So complaints are, are worth, and I think the next one, oh no, I, I didn't put it in, good. Um, right to make a complaint can happen in a couple of things a, and a couple of ways that you need to be sensitive to. Um, first of all, I, I make a complaint to the Data Commission. Here I am, I live in Dublin, I'm sitting here in Dublin this morning. Um, I make a complaint to the Irish Data Commission. However, if I've sent you a CV and I'm living in Italy, I have the right to make a complaint to the Italian um, Data Commission, who will confer with the Irish Data Commission, who will confer with you. So the Irish Data Commission will operate with the Italian Data Commission, but ultimately that's who's up, who, that's who's organising the complaint and seeking the information on my behalf. And um, so the 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 purpose of GDPR was to to unite Europe them and the member states of the European Union that it didn't matter where you were, you could make a complaint in your own country. And um, so, so it's not jurisdictionally exclusive, 
the jurisdiction is the entirety of the uh, of the EU. So that's making a complaint to the Data Commission. That ends up in fines generally from the Data Commission or corrective action from the Data Commission. You'll see that in a few minutes. Um, however, people also have a right to make what is the equivalent of a personal injuries claim um, when it comes to um, making a complaint. So they can go to a solicitor and institute legal proceedings to the district or to the circuit or high court, depending on the, the, mag the, the magnitude of the, of the data breach. Um, so they can do that. And also people unusually, because in Ireland we don't do class actions, but a group of people, so let's say you could have a group of candidates if you were careless and, and if, if you're, you're subject to a cyber attack, you could have a group of candidates come together and institute a class action. And they can be represented by one solicitor or they can be represented by maybe a, a representative organisation. So you could have, if for instance, it was profiling of members of the travelling community, Pave Point could take a, a, a case against you on behalf of, of a group of, 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 you know, that they are representing. So there are things like that to, to think of seriously. The complaint isn't just about the data commission. It's also about the legal redress that's possible. That's very like a, a personal injuries claim. Okay, e-marketing, I just want to say this, e-marketing isn't GDPR, but it's very closely aligned to GDPR. It's a 2012 uh, directive from the European Union uh, that you must comply with. So e-marketing, I'll put up the, the definition there, it is targeting somebody to, in, in an attempt to sell them a service. You have to be very careful how you use your data to ensure that it doesn't come into this because and and that you have gone through clear systems uh, in in direct marketing because it is a criminal offense for direct marketing and furthermore there is no discretion allowed if complaint is made to the to the data commission they don't have discretion it's a, what's called a strict liability offense so they must prosecute and I have an example of a prosecution coming up. And um, so they, they must do that. Um, so just to, to, to be careful, once you're into marketing, you need to do a data processing impact assessment, a DPIA, and you need to go through that process um, it, before you start manipulating data, just to make sure that you don't fall foul of this. Okay, um, so marketing offenses. So I put one up here. The Guerin Media, and this is the first time Guerin Media have been in the in, have been in the courts over how they deal with their their data. But uh, Guerin Media, uh, for instance, were prosecuted for sending, um, now, and there are three charges relating to the sending of unsolicited marketing e emails to two individuals without their consent. To two, so they ended up in the court. They got fines of two thousand euros, uh, totaling six for the three, um, the, the the three unsolicited, the three different charges. But it's the reputational damage. You go on to the Data Commission website; they list all the prosecutions, they list all the companies that fall foul of this law. And um, but here it is that the, this is a criminal prosecution. So if you're a director of a company, that becomes a problem for you. And um, so just to be careful, you can, of course, you can market, of course, you can prospect using data. But there is a procedure that must be gone through before now. And time is too short, and it's far too detailed and important um, to, to to squash into this. This, this particular time, but it, it, you must go through that process. Okay. Recent prosecutions that are just to do with the data commission themselves, uh, where there is a complaint, move or, or an organization that um, support and uh, facilitate change where, and it's a particularly a men's organization. I didn't pick on it. This just happened to be um, a good example, maybe I thought, uh, of, of what can happen and what you need to, to think about. Um, they uh, do group sessions, they facilitate group sessions, and they record their group sessions. It's mainly for the purposes of reviewing um, the, the counsellor and it's for, for things like that. And they stored their uh, data from those group sessions on, on 18 cards that, they, you know, on memory cards. And in that, they lost control of memory cards. They got lost. They were told they were in breach. I mean, obviously, it's a very serious situation where people are in counselling sessions, in group therapy sessions, and that that information is lost. So it, so it showed that there wasn't a protocol in place 
for uh, holding those memory cards very, very securely. Um, so they they got uh, they they were reprimanded about their and so two things happened. First of all, the decision was made, and then there are corrective powers as well as the power to impose the fine that that goes on to the organisation. Um, and they were they were to change how they they record their group sessions. They were to to look at how they and then they got a fifteen hundred euro fine. But also, what happens is they're on the data commission website, and so there's a reputational damage associated to that. Where that might affect you is if you have training sessions within your own company, um, and you record them, and um, you need to be careful about where that recording takes place. What is the reason at the beginning of this uh, that I said if, when we're doing the question and answer session? That is going to be edited uh, to make sure that there's no disclosing uh, because it, the, the recording of this session will be available to the people that were un, unable to make it today and to yourselves. Uh, so there are things like that that, that are important. You've got to think about what is in the data? What are we storing? So that's data minimization, data storage, you know, how you're processing the data. That's where those principles get engaged. Um, Slain Credit Union also were uh, prosecuted last year, and uh, that was uh, with regard to their how they stored inquiries on their website. And there they were found. So let's look at their corrective action. Their corrective action was that they were they've been fined five thousand euros, and um, and they were reprimanded for for the infringements for not having processes in place, and because it's financial, there were they so the the first one there of it was a breach of the of Article five and thirty two that they didn't have appropriate technical and organizational measures. So they weren't securing their data properly. And this was information on inquiries coming in. So it was it was disclosing, it was people maybe giving out why they were looking for a loan, why they were um, making a, a um, an inquiry. Uh, and so there's personal data in, in behind that as well. Uh, so that that, that, that that carelessness, but it is again, the reputational damage of that being published on the, on the Data Commission website. And that's it. Okay, so sorry, stop share.